All right, looks like we're going live. Yep, it looks like it's running just fine. So, hello everyone, my name is River, and welcome to the Nimiton. Today, I'm actually going to be talking about something very particular, some a subject that I kind of neglect, which tends to be, you know, alchemy. It, it is something that I find very enjoyable, but something that I've spent a lot of time not really getting into with all of you, which I apologize for that. I really should be a little more proactive about that particular subject matter. So, here's our chance. One of the things in alchemy that I find so interesting is the idea of self-development and change. Very much like the hero's journey, we find that time and time again, the alchemical process represents the idea of well, just development. It represents you becoming someone other than who you are now. And we see a lot of uh, intrinsic differentiation between you know, the symbols and signs that are relative to it. Now, the main symbol of the alchemical process of change, in my opinion, is the crucible. So we have to talk about the crucible from a symbolic standpoint. So uh, before I start getting into questions and checking out chat and everything, I just want you to know that the crucible is essentially a container. It's a space. It's a thing. And it likes to burn up or eat away at all things that are excessive and unnecessary. Now, I thought it'd be quite fun to poll all of you to see your thoughts on it. Now, the way that I organized this question was very straightforward. What about, uh, or, you know, how do you think? And I dealt with uh, pain. You know, no pain, no gain, classic statement, or the idea of comfort creating power. And then, of course, something else was actually the dominant statement for the longest time. Um, it still is now, I believe, uh, that, that everyone had their own interpretations of development and how we experience life and how we deal with it and everything that we do. But in this particular case, what I was really looking for was to describe the idea of refinement. So, the crucible, this idea of eating away things that are excessive or unnecessary... The entire idea behind it is that it's it's literally burning up what's not working for you. It, this could be anything, like bad habits, uh, improper thoughts, you know, uh, just anything that's counterintuitive to the development of your own personal being. In the alchemical process, we see that you have to get rid of certain things. And I'm going to use the allegory of wine. So, wine is quite nice. Many people of ancient history quite like it, and there's a reason for that. But something to understand is that wine does not exist as it is, right? We have to make wine. We have to develop it. And we do this through a process called fermentation. Fermentation is well understood by many of us, but on a spiritual level, fermentation really represents the degradation of something by literally stewing it. Uh, this stewing process, so to say, is taking something and making it into a new, better form of itself simply by allowing it to sit. Uh, when we think about this in a worldly way, because I do believe that alchemy needs to be rather worldly. Imagine something that does not work for you currently, but will work for you later as long as you can develop into it and give it enough time to become something better than what it is. This can be any particular habit. Uh, but when we deal with these things on a psychological level, we have to you know, boil it down, so to say, and give it time. It has to rot. Granted, rotting is a very uh, antagonistic way to say it. But it has to rot and has to break up, and then eventually it will become something of great value. One way we might think about the idea of development in the alchemical process is much like creating a weapon. And by weapon, I mean a, a medieval weapon, something made of metal, which many weapons are, but you see what I'm saying. Uh, first, you have the rock, and then you pull metal from the rock, and then you take that metal and you melt it down, and you make it into a bar, and then you shape it with, with high heats, and you mold it with oils and water to, you know, you dip it. If you've ever seen that in movies, they dip it into oil or water to um, quickly cool it. This is the, the process of tempering something. It's called tempering, and the thing about temperance is that much like that, the human being must be molded. You know, and, and the thing is, is we are both our own smith and the thing being smithed, so to say. We are both the changer and the changed uh, independently. So when we consider these factors, we must realize that whether we want to or not, we will be different. It's all about the mode in which we engage with it. It's all about the direction that we take and how we you know, work our way through this changing process. And it doesn't have to be bad. So the thing about the poll is my entire question really based on the idea is, is change bad or good? And how do we view change? 
Granted, a lot of the comments went a very different route, which is totally understandable, but that was not the basis of the, of the discussion as far as I saw it. So, when we understand the idea of change, change is typically unfun. It is. Let's be real. Change is unfun, especially if it's dramatic and chaotic change. But dramatic and chaotic change, and we might even just say hardship, can be some of the best developing periods of our lives. In the alchemical process, this descent, so to say, this cathartic experience is typically not fun, in my personal opinion. In fact, many people back out of it. But when we consider the idea of this self-development, as I called it very early on at the beginning of this channel, self-transmutation, there is something to be considered about surviving the strife. <laughs> and by surviving, I don't literally mean surviving. What I really mean is making it through with, you know, with proper engagement and personal development. Now, it'd be rude for me at this point. I should check the chat. Uh, I'm going to pull the image down. Everyone's seen the poll. Let's see what we got. Hey, what's up, Austin? Yam, cool to see you. All right. Thoth, hey, what's up? Phosphorus Thoth, good to see you. Scrunch man. Donum Day is a thumbnail. Good stuff. Yeah, I do. Uh, for those who don't know, the thumbnail is actually a, uh, it, it's a, you know, a display of the three colorations that are common to alchemical practice, which is black, white, and red. Uh, the white and red represent actually the two different stones at the end of the work, like the Philosopher's Stone, as many people call it. Uh, and the black is the more base developmental state. It can also be applied to salt, sulfur, and mercury. It's a phenomenal alchemical piece, in my personal opinion, and represents the developmental processes. And, uh, all right. Never turn a blind eye to suffering, to the negative. Suffering is something to be surpassed. I agree. That is the basis of this conversation. I 100% agree. Suffering is something to be surpassed. It is a developmental phase, and we need to understand it outrightly. Now, I guess we can take this a little bit further. Seeing as there's really no questions or any sort of confusion or anything like that, I suppose we can take a little bit further. When we deal with the idea of alchemy, one of the main things to be considered and dealt with we must understand that whether or not we believe we're making a physical stone or a spiritual stone or, you know, a human mental stone, much like we see quite often this idea of a golden mind rather than a golden spirit, that there will always be development. There will always be a shift in the sands. And development, as I said, tends to be uncomfortable. It tends to not necessarily be the most fun thing in the world. However, it is still worthwhile. And we realize this through our actions, right? As I use the example of creating a sword or the examples of wine, there is a refinement process to all things. And in many ways, aging is in and of itself a refinement. And we have to acknowledge this. Refinement creates a new version of yourself because of the way that time and change work, we create a new self. And this new self is typically of a higher caliber than the one that we're currently dealing with. Granted, I think perspective deals a lot with the idea of our to be honest, ideas of pain, uh, because the actual basis of struggle and difficulty are illusory, right? Like, let's really look at what pains us. What are our struggles? How do we deal with these things? Quite often, or more often than not, I should say, our idea of strife and struggle is rooted in, well, context. It's not really existent as much as it is context. Now, physical pain does exist. No, don't get me crazy. I'm not saying physical pain doesn't exist. But the idea of having, we should say, the experience that we don't enjoy does not necessarily make it a bad one. Uh, again, coming back to pain is contextual, we often compare things to each other. So let's say we have a painful period. That painful period is really just based on being bad from a period where we thought things were good. And that tends to be based on things being easy, you know, or we might say uh, in high development. But the greatest shift in the individual psyche and in our habits and in how we deal with our lives and what we do is actually rooted in the struggle. You know, it is very often that we find that the greatest shifts occur in a tumultuous time rather than a comfortable one. In fact, comfort can be directly related to the idea of stagnation, you know. So it's worth considering. Many of us seek peace. And what I mean by that is the human brain is actually hardwired to look for ease, right? It, it tries to use the least energy for whatever it is that it's doing. But being counterproductive like that, and I, I guess it's not really counterproductive, but being less engaged like that means that we have a, you know, a failing, you know, we are not actually in development at that point, And that's a problem. Now, I, I'm, I'm going to check up on comments. Sorry about that. Uh, for everyone who's here. 
Grow beyond yourselves. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Invent yourself and reinvent yourself. Also a good way to say it. There's no growth or motion without friction. Yeah, 100% agree. And that's one of those things that we have to understand. Uh, <laughs> what have I missed? Nicola, you haven't missed anything. I gave a basic alchemical discussion on the idea of change and fermentation and self-development. Uh, this is a very psychological viewpoint for the most part. I'm not necessarily doing the physical one, but we can do a physical one. So let's use a physical example. Uh, exercise. Okay. <laughs> the, the big bad exercise. When we understand that exercise is literally just the application of pain and struggle against the body for its own development, which it does become stronger and better because of that. It's basically the same as the weapon explanation. You know what I mean? You are applying force against yourself, thereby strengthening it. It's the same idea, but you can do it mentally. And many people argue that you can even do it on a spiritual level. And I like to believe that these types of developments, these types of applications, so to say, of immediate force are very good for us. A mental application of force, for an example, so y'all can understand what I'm getting at, would be something like challenging a new subject matter. So in esotericism and occultism, we tend to have a lot of, oh, I like this style or I like that style. I don't study anything else. I think that's very wrong. I think it's very beneficial for us to bridge outside of our typical spheres so we can develop. And that development allows us to refine, literally, to temper the sword, so to say, of our own ideas and experiences. It allows us to better understand how we think and how we feel and our actual theological basis personally. This is a really big deal, too. I think many people bail out of it because it can be intimidating. You know, we want to have the comfort of, you know, seclusion in a sense. But that seclusion does not really benefit us outrightly. So when it comes to alchemy, my ultimate idea of alchemy, I should say, is that uh, no pain, no gain. That was what I put on the poll. It's not to say that everyone else's ideas were wrong, by the way. So there was a lot of stuff that was entered into the comments, which was a totally different direction on the ideas of life and everything like that. And many of them are really, really good. But the way I saw it, personally, was that when it comes to development, you do have to go through the strife. However, here's a trick, because I, I did kind of play a joke on you. Comfort can create power. That's something to consider. Comfort can create power. It doesn't necessarily gain, but it can create power by the sense of stagnation. You know, we live in a physical world that allows us to stagnate force in the form of, like, money or resources. And the stagnation is in and of itself uh, powerful. You know, uh, it can be distancing and elevating. Uh, but the thing is, is the individual on a, on a higher level, in a sense, and in a, on a spiritual and mental level does not necessarily change just by sitting around doing nothing, which is why the pole is shaped the way that it is. So, uh, oh, wow, that's a lot of comments. <laughs> hey, I'm glad I said your name right. Better physical example is just the literal work. Yeah, Scrunch Man is correct. The literal work of alchemy is a phenomenal physical example. Uh, it gets into a lot of general symbolism about alchemical practices. Uh, I know there are a lot of people who disregard the physical. I've been accused of being one of those people. I like to believe that it exists. That's how I look at it. I have not attempted it, though. And uh, there's a lot of argumentation behind why it would even be possible. Now, the thing is about physical alchemy and the, and the presentation of physical alchemy, one of our issues is that we do not necessarily have an example of an ambrosia. So say the stone literally gives you eternal life, you know, all those things. It's basically ambrosia. For those who don't know, ambrosia comes from the, uh, the Greek food of the gods, so to say. Uh, it's a perfecting food. And uh, the means by which to obtain it come from a spiritual source. Therefore, we can't you know, really claim it in the physical world, which is a big part of physical expressions of alchemy. Uh, not with wrath do we slay, but with laughter. Nice. Uh, for those who don't know, in the Kabbalah, actually joy is considered the answer to uh, all strife and struggle, which is true. You can find joy anywhere. All right. Change can be painful, but you've got to cultivate the correct method to change. Exactly. So that's the thing. Uh, Charlie just said something really, really great. If we engage with spirituality, and we're looking at this on a mental level even, or a physical level, you've got to be moving in the right direction. The entire idea about productive change is not change for change's sake. It's about having an environment in which you make proper change. So, for example, coming back to exercise, you can't just move weights 
to actually develop to the best of your ability. You've got to do it with particular motions. The, you know, the muscular structure demands particular motions for particular muscles. In the same way, on a mental level, you can't just read anything. Amish romance is not going to make you understand Kabbalah. You've got to have direction, and that direction changes everything. Honestly, it's rigidity in how you actually protect yourself against these things is very valuable. All right, there's a stone that is not a stone that has a shape that is a shape. What is it? It is the mind. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Mental Ninja is correct, for those who can see the chat. So, I guess something to really get into on alchemy is the extensive symbolism. I think a lot of us get confused. We see a lot of symbolism. We see a lot of different authors. So I want to say something for those who get this far. Alchemy is not a perfect practice, like all things. It has limitations, and these limitations are built on the fact that it is a personal pursuit. In the same way that we all experience individualistic lives and not other people's lives, our own lives, so is the same about the idea of hermeticism and alchemy. Hermeticism does have a few more uh, rigid solutions, However, alchemy is so open-ended that we have to realize that its practice is just hyper-personal. Hermeticism can be the same because they do tend to get fused by people, let's say Mary Atwood, right, famous hermeticist and alchemist. Uh, for those who have never heard of Mary Atwood, she's very, very good. I highly recommend her uh, Suggestive Inquiry into Hermetic Mystery. It's a good book. Very hard to read, though. Uh, but we understand that the process of alchemical experience is individualistic. It is not tied to one particular subject matter in that sense. It is personal, and that personal expression plays a large role in its development, and your development, to be frank. The sages use most of the symbolism to mislead you. They confess this themselves. It's very possible. I think general symbolism might actually not be that misleading. Uh, I also like to believe that if they're so misleading and they tell you they're being misleading, they might be lying in that statement alone. Audio got weird. Huh. Is it still bad? What about now? Did my signal go bad, maybe? No, my internet might have gone bad. I'm not entirely sure. Weird. Oh, well. Well, I guess we're going to have to call the stream short. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know, y'all. I don't know what happened. I may have been talking really quickly, so uh, running the data through the internet and everything may have done some stuff. <laughs> okay, cool. Oh, well, then I don't know what y'all heard and what you didn't hear. I guess we'll have to figure that out. But my entire thing about, uh, oh, Restoration of the Breach. Hello, good to see you. Uh, Restoration of the Breach does a lot of cool Kabbalah with a Christian influence, by the way, for those who don't know. It's very good stuff. All right, well, I'm glad the audio is fixed. It's unfortunate that it stepped out for a moment there. At least it was only about 30 seconds. But to come back to something, because, again, we are talking alchemy, so I'm not going to just bail on the subject. To come back to something, we must understand that the general symbolism of alchemy, as far as I see it, like sulfur, salt, mercury, the white unicorn, for example, or the, the you know, the uh, swan, and all these different symbolic representations, while we try to pin them down, what we really need to do is look at it on a personal level. What I mean by that is let's look at something like metal, okay? Let's think about metal as a contextual idea. So for those who don't know, in alchemy, the alchemists believe that metals were literally like plants. They are literally the plants of the, uh, of the earth. They literally, you know, they grow underground. In the same way a man exists above ground and an animal exists above ground but eats of the grass and things like that without any cultivation. So too is there a seedling that's placed into the earth and it sprouts. That's your plant. And then there's a new one or we should say the deepest level, which is the one that grows in the earth itself. Now, we know today that that's not how that works. We know that metals don't literally grow. But for the longest time, the alchemists spent many years trying to figure out where they came from and how they grew, because they wanted to propagate them. This is why when you read about the philosopher's stones, the uh, red stone and white stone specifically, when they come in contact with something, they 
create a new version of the song by by literally touching you know if you imagine this in the terms of people if you have a self fully realized individual who comes in contact with someone then they become elevated and that is in itself the propagation of the stone uh it's a funny little idea because it doesn't really apply in modern science anymore but it is the basis of that idea generally some people disagree with that the account of the generation of metals is 100% correct. You just have to understand it correctly. I'm not saying that the generation of metals isn't correct. What I'm saying is their idea of seed in their worldview at the time is not the same as we have it today. It is still correct. The philosophy holds up when you understand that metals come out of stars, right? But they didn't know that. And that's pretty, under, pretty easy to understand. Yeah, the crucible. So... Yeah, the crucible, as I'm putting it, deals with the idea of being put in a space of tribulation. Trial and tribulation cause development, as long as we have the particular focus to do that development. There's varieties of change in this particular style of change. Now, the crucible tends to apply specifically to burning things up, but fermentation is also technically a shifting form uh, through this kind of self-development. Terrence McKenna described alchemy insanely good. That's true. Uh, when River starts talking about alchemy, his voice transmute into a higher, more robotic form. Oh no. It might be bad again. I hope not. Nature does make stars, scrunch man. I don't understand what you're trying to say there. <laughs> All metals are made in stars. For those who don't know, by the way, the intense pressure of nuclear fusion causes a compact uh, form and a development of these particular uh, like atomic structures that make metal and then when the star explodes at the end of its life it expands all these metals into the world and they get caught up in rock and form and then we can dig it out and that's actually where we get it what do you think about michael myers atalanta fugians i'm actually reading that right now again joseph very good question a atalanta fugians is a really awesome text in fact uh you know what let's do something fun let's do something fun because i already had it available uh let's see here all right, y'all are going to get something real special today. I just need to add uh, a uh, input capture, which I wasn't expecting to do this. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, that's not going to work. <laughs> oh, my goodness. This is always fun. There it is. There it is. Okay, there we go. All right, let's just crop my face out for a second here. We can take a look. So I was recently reading Atalanta Fugians, which was the question that was posed in the comments. Thank you for asking. So here's the thing about Atalanta. We understand that there is an intense symbolic understanding of self-development, not just self-development, but also of the creation of the pinnacle human being, right? And what's really curious is that Meyer, back in 1618, developed these plates. Um, I, I call them plates. Some people just call them images. Uh, but these particular plates all have very intense symbolic relationships to them. So let's actually look at the one that's related to metals and everything else. And it starts right here. Just a moment. So, emblem two. Very good. This particular plate has a very intense image, a very interesting image of the idea of the entire planet being the uh, mother to the characterization which we are developing. So what we may not understand, what some of you may not understand if you've never been exposed to this type of material before, is that we're literally essentially making the perfect person. Now, there's a lot of imagery that suggests that they are created as perfect. That's not what we're doing right now. That's more of a Christian basis of the idea of a perfected human being coming into the world rather than making a perfected human being. Traditional alchemy makes perfect people. And the symbolism and ideology behind this is that it is built out of challenge, first of all. But second of all, that they are alive. Now, that seems so basic and so straightforward, but to be existent, to be alive and existent, is the necessary component for you to actually start developing. There is... An understanding in spirituality, uh, and by spirituality I mean like the mystical spirituality, that the development of the human, and I mean this on a spiritual level as well, like the literal changing of your soul, so to say, in most mysticisms, 
deals with the idea of you coming into the world and then coming out of it. And when you come into the world, in, into the state of existence, you are immediately put into strife and struggle. I mean, your body is literally fighting itself all the time. It is in a wearing state. It is in a self-destructive mode. And the womb of the earth, as described in Emblem 2, as we can see here, is that what it calls it? I can't remember. Ah, oh, it mentions nursing. It mentions nursing. Uh, right here. But the idea is that we are literally thrust into life. We are forced into this place that we call, you know, Earth and living and reality and all that. And this particular existence allows us for developments that shift our world. All theologies hold a certain space for those who are good, go to a certain place. Those who aren't, go to a different place. Those who are better, go to an even better place, right? But those are all based on worldly action. So we have a pre-existent human philosophy that the tier of reward is based on what goes on here. But when you're up there, it doesn't change anymore, right? It tends to be the general idea. Now, in mysticism, specifically Kabbalistic mysticism, that's not true. You still do stuff in the spiritual worlds that allows you to move through them. Uh, but the spaces in which you're most affiliated can change based on what you do in life. Now, this idea of being nursed by the entire globe, we understand, is more of a reference to reality rather than literally the planet, right? Uh, some people will argue that this deals specifically with the idea of metals. So we have to understand a certain philosophy about metal. Metal is living in the alchemical tradition. In the old alchemical tradition, uh, metals are alive, <laughs> which is where we get all of our uwu crystal magic nowadays. For those who don't know, that's where that's where that started. Uh, our uwu crystal magic really starts at the idea of believing that metals were living. And I'll tell you why they believe that, because uh, I don't want to confuse anyone. I don't want anyone to think, Oh, you know, I don't, I don't know what's going on anymore. So the reason that they believed that metals were alive, by the way, is because it was literally like a vein. You know, you've probably heard of a vein of metal, but if you really look at metal running through a rock down in a cave or something like that, it has um, like a literal vascular design to it. So they believed it was almost as if a physical water that was made solidified and existed as blood inside the earth. That's why they call it Blood of the Earth, which is a video that I'm going to do eventually. Blood of the Earth is very cool. Uh, and it comes, I'm pulling that particular description from Atwood again. Atwood's uh, a suggestive inquiry into Hermetic mystery. But we should realize to a great extent that these types of symbols and ideas and the symbolism plays a role in our lives. So what is the metal of the human being? Well, we call it the blood of the earth in the same way we understand that the life force, the lowest life force of the individual is the cell, right? And that's worth being understood. Now, many people would like to say it's the atom, right? But the atom is not living. It's not organic. But the cell is organic. And we can amalgamate millions, millions of amalgamated cells just make up an existent human being with, a, with an independent consciousness that stands over all of them. In many ways, if you really get into Kabbalah, this is the explanation behind the divine form. This is the divinity's existent space. You know what I mean? It is the whole self-conscious that rules over these thousands of cells and this independent, subconsciously active brain that keeps it all running. You know what I mean? So we have a fusion of worldliness and spirituality that bridges the gap between what it is that is belief and what it is that is reality. Uh, I have to catch up with chat really quick. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's see. I highly recommend you get Apples from the Orchard. It's an excellent discourse on alchemy in the four worlds. Yes, I do have Apples from the Orchard. It is a phenomenal book. If you ever want to get into Lurianic Kabbalah, you should read that. I highly agree. Sound doesn't matter as long as we can hear you. Thanks, Valentin. I do like to have good audio, though. <laughs> American Idol also makes stars. <laughs> I mean, you're not wrong. Uh, the generation of metals, you're being a bit too literal. I am being a bit too literal, and I happen to do that. When I stop talking alchemy, my voice returns to normal. Hmm. Yeah, a man in a temple has a crucible by which he summons me. Yeah. The hermetic art. It is. It is the hermetic art. So, to let's let's get into something specific. Hermeticism and alchemy are actually almost perfectly synonymous. 
I think a lot of people don't understand that. The Hermetic style, the philosophy of early Hermeticism is in many ways the influencer for later Hermetic ideas or alchemical ideas. This is because philosophy bridges outside of dictation. You know what I mean? We didn't have all these people like Kant and Nietzsche to have these arguments of philosophy. We had this observational philosophy. And observ observational philosophy tends to follow a very specific paradigm instead of rules. This is why we have things like the usage of uh, gender allegory and things like that in mysticism. It is because it's observational. It's because they are literally looking at the world as they saw it at the time and creating entire paradigms and ideas out of it. Do you understand how the four elements generate our life force as spirit beings? All right, fine. That's a good question. Let's do this. Let's look at the four elements in a way that we otherwise might not. So we're not going to say fire, water, wind, and earth. Let's look at the fact that you literally, you're an oven. You're literally an engine. You might not realize that, but your stomach, your body, your breakdown of material and matter is literally an engine. You are generating thermal energy, just like a train. And you're literally breaking all that stuff down and supplying the energetic force behind it to the rest of your body to keep it going. It's what you do. That's what your body does naturally. It's your limitation. You don't have a choice not to do it, otherwise you'll just die. So we already have fire, right? The thermal aspect. The idea of the air is literally just the external idea of space. That's on a symbolic level. But on another level, it's literally the taking in of essence from the external environment that is then fueled through the lungs to get another component, which is the oxygen, which we use to fuel those cells as well. So we're literally fueling everything through these different forms. Uh, I don't think many people realize that. We literally fuel ourselves through the forms. Water. It's the next one. You have to be hydrated. Earth is the tangibility. We can literally relate this to something like food. You know what I mean? Every, every energetic force in the four elements is essentially a food. It is a resource that the body is using to then fuel its natural state. It keeps its cells moving, keeps the body functional, and the body has been developed around the elements rather than the elements developed around the body, hence why it is part of the Hermetic philosophy and the most antiquated of all occult styles. Now, the crucible is not necessarily used to summon the other, but the crucible is used to develop the independent individual into the next one. So, in a way, you're right. You know what I mean? You could literally describe it that way. We could get arcane and say we summon a new form of ourselves through change and strife and struggle. I'm not going to say we have to say it that way, though. I'm trying to get a better idea of what the man wants from me. <laughs> to be honest, focus on self-independent ideas. The entire basis of change and strife and struggle is literally the self-benefactor of our own development. It's the best that we can do. All right. Well, this has been very nice. I will leave it up. I'll give you about two minutes to throw up questions if you have any. And then after that, we're going to call it. Also, thank you everyone for coming. This has been very nice. I appreciate all of you being here. Of course, I'm doing streams every single Sunday now. Uh, some of them are going to be quite good. Some of them I think are going to be a little bit more difficult. Some are just going to be basic. We'll see what happens in the future. But, I mean, the general viewership for the live streaming has been really good. Really, really good. I didn't even know that y'all just wanted to chat with me. Alkahes discovered by Paracelsus. Okay, hang on. Pause. That's a good statement. For those who don't know, many of you have probably watched the TV show like Full Metal Alchemist, right? Look, Von Hohenheim from that anime, and I know many people get cringy about that, but the idea that it comes from an anime, Von Hohenheim is a real person. Paracelsus Von Hohenheim is a human being that existed in history and is a phenomenal alchemist. In fact, he's not an alchemist in the way that we think of it necessarily, but he was a bit of a spiritual alchemist, but his main line of work was medicine. He's actually the discoverer of the idea of something like a vaccine, whether y'all believe it or not. His famous quote is that the poison is in the dosage. So he realized that we could develop tolerance and development against things that would otherwise kill us through small exposures. Again, coming back to change, this is the idea of having exposure to strife and struggle in a controlled environment, which allows us to develop. School is a good example of this. What's the name of the anime again? Full Metal Alchemist. Here, I'll just type it in. Uh, uh, Jennifer, that's, that's the show. You can find it on Netflix. Uh, but the, the dad, so to say, is Von Hohenheim, as they call him. He is actually Paracelsus.
Paracelsus was a real human being. Uh, many people get surprised. You can actually find Paracelsus's works in PDF form online, and you're not stealing them. Paracelsus has been dead for a very long time, <laughs> um, but a very genius individual. Uh, I put him on level with people like Francis Bacon very quickly, at least for their era. Uh, I missed this. I'll be back to catch the full replay. That's okay. If you have any questions, you can feel free to ask me right now. Uh, I'm going to give it just another minute really quick. I know many people are ready to go. Uh, but Alkahest, by the way, so Joseph, in, in dealing with Alkahest, this is a particular philosophical standpoint in alchemy of energetic form, right? So the energetic interrelation of alchemy was something that was very particular to Paracelsus. But if you look into Eastern tradition, I talk, I'm talking things like uh, the philosophies behind Chinese acupuncture and stuff like that. That's where you really get to know. Is that your mask on the icon slash avatar? No, uh, the mask is actually not related to alchemy. It has a lot of general symbols in it, but it's actually the ohm and a lot of other things. It is, is mostly not alchemical in nature, though. We could fuse their metaphysical styles and get a good answer or explanation out of it uh, because they're so similar already, but I'm not going to claim that it is because that would be unfair. I didn't develop it that way. All right, and that looks like that's about it. Just to be fair, I'll give another 30 seconds, and if we don't get a question by then, I'm going to catch you all later. Oh, is it my mask? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I do actually have it. It does physically exist. Uh, I, in the photos, am wearing it. Have you ever created the Alcahest? No, I have not. I haven't. I, I don't have any of the implementations behind it. I've done a little bit of distillation for the sake of practice and entertainment, but that's as far as I've gone. And I don't mean that in the mental and emotional way. I mean, like, that's the physical thing that I've done. There's a little bit of dissolution, dissolation. Uh, that's about it. God, I caught this live. Thank you, thank you. It's in Mosh Cardi. Don't know what that means. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, it's a song. Very cool. I wonder what its general concept is, though. I don't know what its concept is. I'll have to check it out later. All right. Okay, we do get a final question. I will answer. Okay, so this is a very big question. So we'll cover it. And then we're going to call it after that, just because it's such a large uh, piece. So the question is, what brought you into the metaphysical? Asked by Cloud101. So here's the thing. Metaphysics is the greatest thing that ever happened to me. I love philosophy. I particularly like the idea of the philosophy of the heavens, right? So metaphysics deals with the idea of physical reality and its relationship to spiritual reality, whether that be true or false. And it tends to bridge outside of that and come to certain philosophical conclusions through observant philosophy. So such things as like the monad, you know. And when we understand these kind of core concepts, they don't necessarily change our lives, but they definitely change the way that we look at the world. And I think for the better. I got obsessed with metaphysics because of my love for Kabbalah. And the, the Kabbalah is ultimately, in many ways, a metaphysical relationship. Uh, what is done physically is used to express a certain spiritual occurrence, and a spiritual thing is used to express a physical thing, and vice versa. So without metaphysics, you don't really have mysticism, and that's kind of why I got so into it. Uh, it happened at random, though, I will admit. I was not always into metaphysics, but, you know, through Zohar and a few other texts and environments, I became obsessed. And Abraxas has Hermetus. Yeah, glad to have you. Well, all right, everyone. This has been River at the Nemeton. I appreciate you all jumping in. This has been really fun. Thank you for your questions. And I'll catch you next time. And look forward to that next poll because that is your clue on what it is that we're going to be talking about. I know it's not a very good clue, but your engagement does shift the entire basis of the actual discussion. I'll see you next time.